Moving on to the next topic, knowledge representation. So what is knowledge representation? Uh, well, it's essentially anything that has to do with storing uh, semantic information and being able to reason about it. So one of the important concepts in knowledge representation is the idea of an ontology. So an ontology may be, for example, the relation between different objects, which object is a type of another object. So for example, a table is a type of furniture and a furniture is a type of object. So in knowledge representation, we have to deal with categories and objects. Those are very different things. A category is a set of objects, and categories can be nested in one another, whereas objects cannot be nested in one another, but objects can be part of categories. The other thing that we want to represent is events, times, and beliefs. So let's look at some examples. Objects, an example of an object can be Martin the cat. Category may be cat. And an ontology may have uh, the following uh, levels, a mammal category that includes the categories cats, dogs, and whales. And cat can include its own subcategories, for example, Persian cat or Manx cat. Now we can define two relations, the is-a relation, which is between an object and a category. So we can say that Martin is a cat. So Martin is an object, cat is a category. And we can also define a relation AKO, which stands for a kind of, which is defined between two different categories. So we can say that Persian cat as a category is a kind of cat. The other uh, relations that can be defined, for example, has a, which is also known as a meronymy relation. For example, has a cat tail. That means that all objects in the category cat have tails. Now let's look at the semantics of first order logic. So first order logic sentences can be assigned a value of true and false. So I can say Milo is a cat. This sentence is true. Milo is younger than Martin. I can say it in the following way. Age of Milo, age of Martin, and then connect those two with the less than symbol. And this entire predicate has the value of true whenever Milo is younger than Martin. Uh, and I can also say that the age of Milo is not equal to the age of Martin in this case. Okay, now let's look at some examples with quantifiers. Suppose that we want to represent the statement, all cats eat fish. Uh, one way to do this is to say for all x, if x is a cat, that implies x eats fish. We can also want to represent events. Suppose that we want to represent a statement that Martin ate. We have to figure out how to do this, but we may also want to represent the statement Martin ate in the morning, Martin ate fish, Martin ate fish in the morning, and so on. So one possible representation is to represent each of those sentences completely independently of each of the other ones. So we can do this in first order logic. We can define a predicate called eating one, which is the first uh, species of eating events. And we have eating one with one argument, which namely is the eater. So every time that we know that somebody ate, we can represent that fact as an eating predicate with that person's name or object's name and as the first argument. Now, suppose that we want to represent the fact that Martin ate in the morning. We cannot use the same predicate, eating one, because that one only has an arity of one. That means it has only one argument. We now have to define a new uh, predicate, eating two, where two is not uh, actually the number of arguments, it's just the second version of the eating predicate. And this particular version takes two arguments, where the first argument is the eater, and the second argument is the time of the eating. If we want to represent the third sentence, Martin ate fish, we have to define a third predicate, which also has two arguments, but then they're different from the previous two. The first one is still the same, the person or object doing the eating, but the second one is the object being eaten. Now, if we want to represent the fourth sentence, we have to define a fourth predicate, eating four, which now has three arguments, the eater, the eaten, and the time. So now, it's very difficult to reason with this kind of predicates. First of all, because there's an infinite number of such predicates, even for the same type of event. And second, because we want somehow to be able to represent them more compactly. So one way to do this is by using the so-called meaning postulates. So the meaning postulate is something like this. We can have a statement in our knowledge base that says, whenever we have an instance of eating four with three arguments x, y, and z, that implies that we also have a statement eating three uh, with the arguments x and y. So we're skipping argument z. 
And eating four with arguments X, Y, and Z implies eating two with arguments X and Z, and also eating four X, Y, Z implies eating one uh, with argument X. So this is a partial solution to the problem, but it's still not going to be a very uh, nice one because we are going to have a large number of meaning postulates and their uh, interpretations can get in each other's way. So there's a second possible interpretation. So the way it works is this. Suppose that we have the eating four predicate with the arguments X, Y, and Z. We can just say that we always have to represent all eating events as instances of eating four and just leave some of the arguments unspecified. So if we have just eating one, we are going to say that Y and Z are unspecified. Well, this seems to work, but it has problems. First of all, there are too many commitments that we have to make because we cannot uh, know the values of all the different arguments. Now, it's very difficult to combine eating four where argument Z is missing and eating four where argument Y is missing. So we cannot combine those two into an eating four instance with both uh, fish and morning specified. So we're going to go to a third possible representation. That is the one where we represent uh, eating as an event, as a special object. So this process is called reification. And this is an example of how we can do it. We can now define an event, E, where E is an instance of a category called eating event. And then there is an eater for event E. The eater's name is Martin and the eaten argument for event E is the fish. So now let's look at ways to represent time. Here's an example. We want to be able to say Martin went from the kitchen to the yard. So one possible way to do this is to say there is an event E where E is an instance of a going event. Going takes three arguments, a goer, an origin, and a target. The goer in this case is Martin. The origin of E is kitchen, and the target is yard. However, this representation doesn't take into account anything about time. We cannot say that, for example, you went from the kitchen to the yard in that particular order. So this representation doesn't give us any information whether the sentence is in the present or in the past or in the future. So let me introduce now an important term in semantics called the fluent. So a fluent is a predicate that is true at a given time. So for example, if I have the predicate t, it can be true at time little t. So here's now a slide that shows you uh, how to represent different relations between temporal events. So two events are said to meet if the end point of an event coincides with the starting point of another event. Before is defined when the end point of an event is before but not equal to the starting point of another event. During is when the start point of an event is after the start point of another event, and its end point is before the end point of that other event. And similarly, we can define overlap. That's when the starting point of the first event is before the starting point of the second event, and the end point of the first event is before the end point of the other event. And you can see that overlap can be defined uh, asymmetrically between i and j. It's possible that i overlaps with j, in this uh, definition, but J doesn't overlap with I. Starts is when two events start at the same time. Finishes is when they end at the same time. And equals is when they both start and finish each other. So this is an example from Russell and Norvig. And one more issue related to knowledge representation is the so-called Reichenbachian theory of time, which takes into account three different points in time, the point of the event, the point of the utterance, and the point of reference. So if we want to represent the sentence, I had eaten, we want to say that the utterance is done now, that's the U point. There is a reference point in the past, and there is an event that is even further in the past. So I had eaten, as the event time. This happens before the reference point, which happens before the utterance. So simple past I ate is when the reference point and the event time are the same, and they both occur before the utterance now. Present perfect is I have eaten. That's when the event is in the past, but the reference point is in the present and coincides with the utterance time. The present time is when all of the three uh, utterance, reference point, and event are the same. And now we have two instances of future tenses. A simple future is when the reference point is equal to the utterance time, which is now, but the event happens in the future. And finally, we have future perfect. That's when the utterance is now, 
There is a reference point in the future, but the event happens somewhere between now and the reference point. So this is an example from Jurafsky and Martin. So the final thing that we want to represent is beliefs. Uh, let's look at an example. I want to say that Milo believes that Martin ate fish. So one possible representation is to say that there are two events. One event named E, which is an instance of eating, and another event called B, which is an instance of believing. And then we can have an entire uh, first order representation. Is a E eating, and eater of E is Martin, the eaten of E is fish. And then we have some information about the believing event. B is an instance of a believing event. The believer of B is Milo. And belief takes as its second argument an object of type eating. So the second argument of believed is E, the event of eating. So one problem with this representation is the following. In first order logic, if you have a um, conjunction of multiple uh, statements, the truth value doesn't change if you drop some of them. So if you drop some of the terms above, you can infer that Martin ate fish, which is not correct because we don't know for sure if Martin ate fish. We only know that Milo believes that Martin ate fish. So representing beliefs in this kind of first order logic format is just not going to work because of this problem. So what people do instead, and again, uh, you can look at this in more detail if you uh, take a course in philosophy or logic, is uh, to use something called modal logic. So modal logic it allows you to represent uh, higher order operators for possibility, time, and beliefs. So this concludes the section on knowledge representation.